good morning. It's great to have you here, and welcome back to our services today. I'm going to ask you to please stand right now, and uh, we're going to begin uh, with a short prayer. Lord, we welcome you. We acknowledge that you are present everywhere, all the time. But Lord, right now, we want to say thank you for being here with us. We realize, Father, that we're not the only church that's meeting today, that uh, there are followers of Jesus meeting around the world, millions of them. Lord, your kingdom is much larger than this place or even the people who are here. Please help us, Father, to tap into that sense that we are part of something that's great and global and beautiful. Thank you for the redemption that we have through Jesus. Today, these songs are for you, and they are being lifted up to praise you, to acknowledge that without you, we would be lost. Thanks, Father. In Jesus, your son's name, we pray. Amen. Oh, 
uh, several years ago, Lynn had shared with me that Sue was going to be off work for uh, a little while. And when I asked Lynn well, why, he said, he kind of smiled and he said, well, Sue decided to donate one of the kidneys. And I said, wow, really? Uh, that's awesome. And I said, uh, so who, who is she donating it to? And he said, well, you know, Sue, uh, she doesn't really know who she's donating it to. She just decided to donate a kidney because there's lots of people out there that, that need kidneys. So it'll be just going to somebody that's her match. And I thought to myself, wow, now that's amazing sacrificial love. This morning we come around the table, around this communion table, the family of God, to remember a sacrifice that's infinitely, infinitely greater than what Sue did for that stranger. 2 Corinthians 5.21 reads, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. When Jesus died on the cross, all our sins without exception were transferred to him. He was without sin, for he was God in human flesh, but he had died for all our sins, and they were all placed on him, and he became the final and complete sacrifice for our sins. Mark 15, 34 reads, Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In that moment on the cross, he was banished from the presence of God because sin cannot exist in his presence. His cry speaks out this truth. He endured the separation from God that you and I deserve. This morning as we take communion, we remember the sacrifice Jesus made so that we could be with him one day in heaven. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we uh, we just come at this time, as I said, as the family of God, just to come around your table to think about what a great sacrifice Jesus made for us in Calvary. I often try to think about what that must have been like for Jesus as he, he cried those words out what that separation for the first time ever uh, from God the Father must have been like as all of our sins of all time from, as far as the east is from the west came upon him and he took those that sin as a sacrifice for, for me and for all Father we just remember him at this time as we take those pieces of bread and the juice and we just think about that sacrifice and the love oh how he loves us it's so true Forgive us, God, when we do so. In Jesus' name I pray.
conquerors through him who loved us for I am convinced that neither death nor life neither angels nor demons neither the present nor the future nor any powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord Turning eyes around 
church. Uh, you know, one of the hardest things for me about this virus is I haven't seen my family in Virginia for almost a year. I usually see them a, a couple times a year. And my mom and my sisters and their husbands, they came up uh, this past September, and, and that's the last time I've gotten to see them. You know, whenever my family comes, it's exciting. I, I imagine when your family, we live out of town, come to visit you, it's exciting for you as well. <clears throat> and I don't know about you, but we clean extra and we prepare beds and plan meals and even plan some entertainment if we can. When they came in September, they walked up to the Veterans Memorial and they were so impressed with our, our, our Veterans Memorial. Uh, we did some things like that. We ate at Casa Grande. They had never eaten there. 
Uh, they liked it like we do. And, but it's just exciting when your family comes to visit. It's also exciting knowing that they're coming to visit. Well, we finish up our sermon series, What Really Matters, this morning. And we've seen that Jesus loves us. That's what really matters. We've seen that Jesus wants to save us. And that's what really matters. And we have seen that Jesus is preparing a place for us. And that is what really matters. We finish up this morning by noticing that Jesus is coming again. He's coming again. Jesus is coming. Our Heavenly Father is coming. And that is exciting. It's exciting. It's also what really matters. When I was a teenager, I loved the Christian group. They were one of the first contemporary Christian groups that came out there. They were called DeGarbo and Key. Uh, and they had a song that was titled, Are You Ready? Are You Ready? Well, I saw them several times in concert. And before they sang the song in concert, Eddie DeGarmo would, would say, the first time Jesus came, he had to stand before Pilate. But when Jesus comes back, Pilate's going to stand before him. Notice some of the lyrics from their song. Are you ready to sit by his throne? Are you ready not to be alone? Someone's coming to take you home. If you're ready, he will carry you home. Jesus Christ is coming. We don't know just when. I know I'll be ready when he comes back again. Are you ready to sit by his throne? Are you ready not to be alone? Someone's coming to take you home. If you're ready, he will carry you home. Rumors of war everywhere. Perhaps you wonder why. Well, don't you worry. A new day's dawning. We'll catch the sun and away we'll fly. Are you ready to sit by his throne? Are you ready? Someone's coming to take you home. If you're ready, he will carry you home. Jesus is coming, which means we must be ready. We must be ready. You know, when you go on a trip to see family or you go on a vacation, you usually do not just wake up on the morning you're going and then throw some things in the car and take off. I mean, usually you do a little plan. Uh, you make a list of things you need to take. You start setting things aside that you plan to pack. You make lists. I mentioned a couple times we went back uh, earlier in the summer to Tennessee. And, uh, Tony's wife, Bailey, actually made spreadsheets of who was going to prepare, took turns preparing meals, and who was going to sign up for certain <clears throat> items that was, would be needed during the week. I took those spreadsheets and made a list, and it was a huge list. It was two columns, full page, food, clothing, we had a little speaker, one in for around the pool, just all kinds of things on that list. And I spent at least two or three weeks marking things off the list. Well, we went to Tennessee and we got settled. Of course, the first thing we wanted to do was get into the pool. Well, I went up to get my bathing suit and guess what? The new bathing suit I bought wasn't on the list. It was back here at home. The thing I would need the most wasn't on the list. You know, when it come, came down to it on that occasion, I wasn't completely ready. So it just makes sense that if Jesus is coming to take us to heaven, coming to take us home, we need to be prepared, even more prepared than we would be for a vacation or a trip to see family. We need to be completely ready. And the way to do that is through Jesus Christ. So with this mindset, Let's notice a parable that Jesus told. Remember, a, a parable is, a, is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Let's notice this parable in Matthew 25, beginning with verse 1. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil and jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom. Come, here's the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all the 
virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both of us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the great wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others also came, Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. Then Jesus said, therefore, keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. Now, this parable does not mean that we need to go out and get oil and land. All right. Again, it's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. The oil actually represents our salvation through Christ. Remember, Jesus told us to be a light, his light to the world. It can only be his light if we are in him and he is in us. And that comes through his salvation. Jesus wants us to show the world his wonderful light. And when Jesus returns, he expects to see our light shining. Shining like a lantern full of oil on a dark night. Now many will say today that there's no hell, so we don't really need to worry about being ready. There, there's only heaven. But they will say the Bible says also that you're not saved by works, you're saved by grace. And that's true. You are saved by grace. Absolutely true. So our works do not get us in. Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ gets us in. However, the lack of works can keep us out. Can keep us out. The Bible also says faith without works is dead. In other words, we, we have to be working and watching it. We have to be ready. If we're not ready through Christ and through faith, we're not getting in. The door's going to be shut. And we will hear those words from Jesus. I don't know you. Notice these words spoken to John by Jesus. They're found in Revelation 22, beginning with verse 12. Look, I am coming soon. Jesus said, my reward is with me. And I will give to each person according to what they have done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. Well, how do you wash your robe? Through baptism. When, when you're baptized, the blood of Jesus covers your sin. How do you keep your robe white? Well, that's through covenant, living in a covenant relationship with Jesus Christ, which includes communion. By coming each week and Examining your heart, taking in his supper, seeking forgiveness, staying in covenant. You know, some people are not ready because they will, or they still have time. They believe they still have time. You know, some of us are 50 years or older. He hasn't come in our lifetime. And we conclude he's probably not coming anytime soon. So, so some just, they don't prepare themselves. People will tell me that they'll get baptized or they'll become a leader or a teacher in the church when they get a few areas of their life figured out. Well, that's not how salvation works. Think back to the first church, the early church. 3,000 people baptized. They only heard one sermon. They were ready to get ready. What shall we do to be saved? Repent, be baptized for the forgiveness of your sin. Peter would preach. People basically say, I'm not ready to be ready. Isn't that amazing? I'm not ready to be ready. Well, there's a warning in God's word concerning that type of thinking and that type of spirit. It's found in 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning with verse 8. The Bible says, but do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, 
not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a great roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That's God's word saying, we have to be ready. Ready and watching. Living holy and godly lives. Yesterday I began my 11th year as the minister here at the First Church of Christ. It's hard to believe. I've already been here 10 years. Um, when we moved here, we had had to make, if you remember, we had to make two trips with a, a U-Haul to get our stuff out here. Family of five. We've lived in one house for 13 years. We had quite a bit of stuff. So Tony and I made the first trip um, because it cost less to... And this is kind of weird, but it costs less to rent two separate U-Hauls than it did to rent one U-Haul and keep it for the two or three days needed. So we rented the first U-Haul. Tony followed me out here. We had some of you help us unload. And then we drove back. Well, we were driving. Tony had been, at that time had a Nissan and Stara, so it's like a kind of a big SUV. He used a lot of gas. I knew we had to get gas before we went back. But I got to talking on the phone with a friend of mine that we were all gonna meet for dinner that night. And so I was driving and I got quite a, quite a bit past uh, Van Wert and the uh, gas light came on. And I was like, okay, well, gas light's on. We'll just stop at the next exit and we'll, we'll grab some gas. Well, you probably know where I'm going with this. If you've ever been on Route 30, there are no exits with gas stations when you get a little bit past Van Wert. I mean, it's like 40 miles of nothing. <laughs> you, you just can't get gas. I kept passing these exits, no gas station. Started getting nervous. And finally, I was like, Tony, we're gonna run out of gas. And sure enough, I, I pulled off this one exit ramp because we were running out of gas. Drifted about halfway up. And I had to get out and walk like a half a mile to someone's house to ask them to help us get some gas. Uh, you know, if, if we're not ready for things, it, it can be costly, can it not? I mean, it cost us probably an hour and a half, not good on the car, uh, cost us a little anxiety, and we just simply didn't have some, some gas. I wasn't ready for the trip. When we go to Mount Vernon now, guess what? I'm ready. I'm ready. The gas tank is full. Because I don't want to pay that cost again. Well, let me tell you this morning, and this is serious, there is no greater cost than not being ready for Jesus' return. No greater cost. Jesus is coming. We need to be ready. Which tells us we also need to be watching. We need to be watching for his return. Are you a people watcher? Some people are people watchers. You just love to watch other people. Uh, some find great enjoyment in watching other people. And it can be entertaining. I used to not be a people watcher. Just didn't pay attention very much. However, my wife is a people watcher. So it's kind of rubbed off on me. We went to the Kokosi River once uh, with some of, of Stephanie's family. And we rented canoes. You can rent canoes there. And ride down the river in the canoe, and then they come down with a bus and a trailer, and they pick you up down the river, you ride the bus back, and they put the canoe on the trailer. So as we started down the river, there were quite a few canoes. It was busy. And we just started watching people because they, they truly were hilarious. Falling out of the boats, just making a mess, going the wrong way, screaming and yelling, even fighting and arguing. It was amazing. But we got about halfway down the river and all of a sudden here comes this canoe just flying by us. And they had too many people in the canoe to start with. And then in the middle of the canoe they had two great big coolers, coolers of beer, that two of these people that probably shouldn't have been in their canoe uh, were sitting on. 
Well, they flew by us and they started drifting right. They couldn't get it back and they went down in this little swell where the water was circling. And sure enough, they spun around like two times and then the, the, the canoe shot up in the air and they all got dumped out. Now you would think they would come up, come up worried about all the people that were in the canoe, making sure everybody could get back to the boat or in the boat. That was not the case. All of them were yelling, get the beer, get the beer. They were worried about that beer. We, we drove till we couldn't see them in sight. They were still diving under to get, get cans of beer. It, you know, we like to watch people, especially when they do something interesting. I, I believe we were created to watch. We watch a lot of things. Last week, baseball started up. This week, the NBA started up. My two sons are extremely happy about this. The women and the family, not so much. But we love to watch sports. And we were made to watch. Watch others, watch our behavior, watch our waistline, watch what lies ahead, watch our health, watch our finances. When you think about it, we, we watch a lot of things. So again, it just makes sense that we must watch for the return of Jesus. Notice 2 Timothy 4, beginning with verse 6. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. These are the words of Paul. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will reward to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. You know, you can't long for someone's appearing unless you're willing to watch. So let me ask you, do you long for his appearing? You know, when I was younger, I'll be honest with you. I wanted Jesus to wait. I wanted him to wait a while before he returned. I wanted him to return. Just wait a little bit. Let my children grow up. I want to experience that. Experience that with them. I want to be a youth minister and a senior minister. I had goals and aspirations. Now that I've lived in this world for 50 years, I'm ready for Jesus to return. I'm ready for him to come. I think about it more and more and more. I actually do watch for his appearance. Notice these words about watching. They're found in Matthew 24, beginning with verse 36. But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. Up to the day Noah entered the ark, they were doing these things, and they knew nothing about what would happen. Until the flood came and took them away. Took them away. He then shares, this is how it will be in the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken and the other left. Therefore, and here it is, keep watch. Because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have left, let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you least expect. You know, we do not know when Jesus is going to return. So we have to keep watch. We don't keep watch like we used to, however, especially when it comes to someone coming to your house or your family visiting. Uh, we used to watch, look out the door a lot more before we had cell phones and GPS, didn't we? We did. They would kind of show up when we least expected it sometimes. But now they can text us, the GPS says we'll be there at 3.13. Or they can text us, just got into to Hicksville. So we pretty much know. Don't have to watch. However, God's word clearly states that his coming will be like a thief in the night. When we least expect it. 
You see, Jesus doesn't want us to watch for his appearing because we think the signs around us are telling us that he's coming. That's not the kind of faith he wants us to have. He wants us to watch for his appearing because we want to be with Jesus. We want to see his coming. You know, Paul struggled with this. Uh, he would say on the one hand, I want to stay here and lead others to Christ. On the other hand, I know to go to heaven is gain. It's better. I want to be with Jesus. Notice Paul's words to the Hebrew church. Hebrews chapter 10, beginning with verse 24. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. As you see the day approaching. Paul says, love one another, do good towards one another, worship with one another, encourage one another towards these things as you see the day approaching. What is that day? That's the day when Jesus comes again to take us home. See, he's not just coming. He came the first time, stayed here, then went to heaven. He's not doing that again. He's coming to take us home. You know, many are struggling right now because the future seems uncertain. I mean, when will this virus go away? When will there be a vaccine? Should I take the vaccine? Will our children go back to school? Will it, will it be safe for them to go back to school? What's sports in high schools and in youth organizations going to be like in the future? Eating in a restaurant, shopping or going to concerts or movies, what's that going to continue to be like? Will we shut down again? You might be even thinking, will the business I work for survive this? So much uncertainty. What Jesus would say to John in Revelation 22, beginning with verse 17. The spirit and the bride both say come. And let the one who hears say come. Let the one who is thirsty come. And let the one who wishes, take the, wishes to uh, take the tree of life, the gift of the tree of life, uh, come. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this scroll. If anyone adds anything to them, God will add to them, to that person, the plagues described in this scroll. And if anyone takes words away from the scroll of this prophecy, God will take away from that person any share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this scroll. He finishes up. He who testifies to these things says, yes. I am coming soon. We don't know what tomorrow holds. We don't know what it is to bring. But we do know this. Jesus is coming again. We're to be a, a testimony to that fact. Think about your life. Does your life give testimony to the fact that Jesus is coming again? In 1950, Ira Stanfield wrote to him, I don't know what holds tomorrow. Notice some of these lyrics. I don't know about tomorrow. I just live from day to day. I don't borrow from the sunshine, for its skies may turn to gray. I don't worry over the future, for I know what Jesus said. And today I'll walk beside him, for he knows what lies ahead. Many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand, but I know who holds tomorrow and I know who holds my hand let, let those words encourage you this morning yeah we don't know what's going to happen there's uncertainty there's anxiety but we do know who holds tomorrow we do know that God is God I hope that song describes your heart this morning Jesus would say again to John Revelation 1 8 I am the Alpha and the Omega says the Lord who is and who was and who is to come the Almighty, who is, who was, who is to come. Not who might come, not who, who may come, but who is to come. We can be certain of that promise. 
John would write in 1 John 2, 28. And now, dear children, continue in him so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. Then John writes these words. Revelation 1, 7. Look, he's coming with the clouds. With the clouds. And every eye will see him. Even those who pierced him, they will see him. And all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. So, so, so shall it be, John writes, amen. So he lifts that up, not only for us to hear, but as a prayer for God to hear. Now all the peoples on the earth will mourn when he returns. To, does that mean that we in Christ will mourn? Well, I'm not sure about that. We may mourn that we're going to heaven. Maybe some of our family and friends aren't. We we'll realize that. But remember what this God said. It says in heaven Jesus will wipe away the tears. So we don't have to worry about that. But I don't believe we'll be here on earth mourning because Jesus has returned. No, I believe that will be a celebration for the Christian. Remember it said two will be at work. One will be caught up. The other will remain. Two will be grinding at the mill. One caught up. One will remain. Those left behind, those that remain, they will mourn. You know, so many people believe when Jesus comes back, we will stand in long lines waiting uh, to be judged and go up these huge steps to heaven. Well, he will judge us and either let us go to heaven or go to hell. Right or left. Now, you may be thinking, there's a, there's a passage that shares that. Jesus will judge all people. He will put those on the right who deserve the right and on the left those who deserve the left. But that's what's so amazing about communion. It's so amazing about covenant. You see, we stay in covenant by meeting around his table. And each week we judge ourselves so that we will not be judged again by Jesus. We judge our hearts. We ask for forgiveness. Jesus forgives us. If we stay in covenant with him, there's not going to be much to judge because his blood is going to cover us. And that's awesome news. We will be caught up with him. We will be home with Christ. Those who are not in Christ will be left here to be judged and they will mourn because the door to heaven, it will not be opened again. We'll stay close. So we finish up how we started with the chorus uh, of Are You Ready? They sing, Are You Ready to Sit by His Throne? Are You Ready Not to Be Alone? Someone's coming, Jesus, coming to take you home. If you're ready, He will carry you home. Jesus loves us, Jesus wants to save us. Jesus is preparing a place for us. Jesus is coming again, and that is what really matters. If you have a decision to make this morning, I pray you'll make it. Let's stand and sing. I was lost. I was in chains. The world had a hold.
about my voice. I thought it was just morning voice, but it's not the virus, I hope. <laughs> but uh, I golfed in a golf outing yesterday and for four hours in the rain. So I think it caught up with me a little bit. So um, it hadn't rained in what, two months? We have a golf outing we've been looking forward to for three months and it rained all day long. But at least we got some rain. I'm sure the farmers appreciate that. Something very exciting for next week, uh, we'll start a new sermon series. It's based on the song by Matthew, uh, Matthew West, Truth Be Told. Um, and we're just going to look at our lives and, and get to the truth of our lives and where we're at in our relationship with God and where we're at in sharing our salvation. And uh, It's going to be based on that song. It's an awesome new song by Matthew West. And so we start that next week. We encourage you to be here. If you can't, it'll be an encouraging uh, series. That's my prayer. Also, we want you to please notice your prayer list this morning. Quite a few people that we need to keep in our prayers. Uh, I was told, I got a late message last night from uh, Hank and Z that Z's brother passed away. So please uh, be in prayer for, for Z and for that family. Also, Ed, are you still on for this week? Ed's having surgery to put a stent in. Is that the plan? Possible stent in on the 4th, right? Yes, for you. So Tuesday at noon. So say a little prayer for Ed, especially around noon if you get a chance to this week. But there's many more on our prayer list. Please keep them in your prayers. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we just thank you for this day we've had to, this time we've had to worship you. We thank you, Lord, that you love us. We thank you, Lord, that you want to save us. We thank you that you're preparing a place for us. And we thank you, Lord, that you're coming again. Lord, just come. We just pray that you come and take us home to heaven. Lord, we do pray for our church, for those within it. We just pray, Lord, that you lead and guide us each and every day. Lord, we, we pray also for the, our new sermon series. May it be an encouragement to each of our hearts. May it allow us to just get focused uh, on you in every aspect of our life. Lord, we do lift up those that, that we've mentioned this morning. These brothers to family and Z and Hank and uh, for Ed and his surgery this week. For the many others who have had surgery recently or who are struggling, Lord, we just lift their needs up to you and ask for your grace to just wrap around them so that they are encouraged each and every day. Again, we thank you for your love and the awesome God that you are. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for coming.